so I'm going to continue the presentation by talking uh, about the risks to rural environments. So Robert just, co Robert just covered the urban environments. All of this work is spatially explicit, uh, but unlike the work on the urban environment, it's, it's based, uh, uh, what I'm going to show, these examples are entirely based on the climate change scenarios and not on the shared socioeconomic pathways. Uh, so we're looking in, in what I'm going to show at the physical effects of climate change on agriculture and the environment. Uh, so uh, Richard Pywell, uh, John Redhead and Matt Brown uh, provided the work on agriculture uh, and Jeff Price, Nicole Falston, Hausler and myself are responsible for the biodiversity contribution. Uh, so agriculture uh, first looked at yield projections and these examples are uh, focusing on wheat and perennial rye grass because those are the two most important crops that are grown in the country uh, by either the amount of, of crop that's produced or the land, the amount of land that is used to produce it. Uh, and the crop net models produce the maximum achievable yield, which means is determined completely by climatic constraints, no effect of fertilizer limitation, no account of pests, diseases, variety, or, or uh, agronomy. What these models do include is water limitation, heat stress, and CO2 fertilization, but importantly, doesn't include associated declines in nutrient and protein content that accompanies CO2 fertilization. It's based on UK CP18 models. Uh, this was combined with CEH's chesscape to produce one by one kilometer projections uh, of, of the climate, taking into account a daily time series of changes in, in climate. And 30 year time slices are extracted around the levels of warming that the project focuses on uh, i.e. two and four degrees in tw the 2080s and two degrees in the 2050s. And in this case, they were also combined for each ensemble member with the CO2 concentration profile to properly account for CO2 fertilization. Uh, in the results that I'm about to show, it does not account for the possibility of growing crops in new areas because of climate change. We'll come on to that later, but this is just looking at where the crops are growing now and what is projected to happen. And also because these are 30 year time slices, it means the interannual variability is averaged out. So uh, here you can see potential wheat yields. The one on the left is our baseline uh, period 1980 to 2010, uh, which agrees well with the DEFRA's records. So the model is being used to simulate the past. Uh, and we can see higher yields in, in the southwest. Uh, and then as climate changes, you can see on the right-hand two slides for two and four degrees, uh, are the reductions in yield in the blue areas expected. Uh, so these are potential yield differences in tons per hectare. And so you can see particularly large uh, changes in yield. So these are increases in yield shown in the blue uh, and some decreases that you can see in the red. By the time you get to four degrees, you're seeing decreases in southeast England. Uh, now, these are results with CO2 fertilization. Uh, as some of you may know, that is uncertain. We don't know if that's really going to materialize. So results are also shown without CO2 fertilization. And in that case, uh, the uh, expected increases in yield are smaller uh, and there is also a lot of variation between the ensemble members. Uh, these are the results for rye grass uh, and here again you can see large increases in yield projected as climate uh, warms but those increases are much less without CO2 fertilization. So I'm going to move on now to what about the changes in suitability of the land for growing different crops as the climate changes. 
Uh, and this is simulated using a model called EcoCrop uh, that uses uh, temperature, precipitation, and soil effects to determine the suitability of growing 182 different crops. Uh, and here you can see the results for maize. So this is a crop where there are considerable increases in the potential for growing the crop as the climate changes. So looking forward across uh, the whole suite of 182 crops, uh, the team isolated the 10 crops that have the greatest increases in suitability in different parts of the UK. So for example, uh, we have uh, large increases potentially for buffalo, bean and horseradish in Scotland or cowpea in East Anglia uh, or stevia in the West Country. But of course at the same time there are also some losers uh, so we have kale, Brussels sprouts, uh, strawberry and rhubarb highlighted as some of the losers. Um, so how different is the future agricultural system under climate change? And the answer is very different, especially in some places. And this map attempts to capture an index of similarity between the future and the current crop communities. Uh, and in this particular graph, if there has been a change in the type of crop, then it is colored dark blue. And if it is only a change from one very similar crop to another, from lentils to peas, it is not colored. So what you can see here is that the areas in blue uh, along the south coast and in that band going up to the north of the country have the greatest difference between the crop community of the future and the crop community of today. And that means, of course, those is where, is, that is where the greatest challenge to adaptation will be. An important caveat to all of this is that none of the interactions uh, with other environmental factors are included. Uh, drought uh, is not fully captured. Uh, there could be interactions with water scarcity uh, due to changes in populations and greater demands for water uh, for other uses. Uh, and there are also large projected increases in pests and diseases accompanying climate change which are, not, which are not accounted for. And at the moment, we don't know to what extent those may offset these uh, projected changes. So overall, it's a picture of dramatic change in the system. And these projected uh, opportunities that I've shown will only be possible with a dramatic change in our agricultural system and the ability to deal with extreme events, pests and diseases. So coming on now to biodiversity, uh, this is based on the Wallace Initiative uh, led by Jeff Price, uh, which uh, we uh, developed some years ago on, under other funding. Uh, this is actually based on CMIP-5 model projections, uh, again extracting time slices for different levels of warming, uh, but based on 21 alternative regional climate change projections. So just like the agricultural work, the uncertainty in regional climate change projection is accounted for. Uh, and in this uh, element of the work, the uh, climate projections were uh, resample to one uh, by one kilometer using, using elevational downscaling and then overlaid over a land cover map, uh, the one that the CH uses to get down to 20 by 20 meters. So our maps are very, very high resolution here. And uh, the model range changes are for plants, invertebrates, vertebrates, fungi, uh, and based on a model that relies on developing a statistical relationship between current species distributions and the current climate, and then assuming that relationship holds into the future. So the first example result I'm going to show here is timber species. So where in the UK will it be possible to grow the tree crops that we use for timber. Uh, so what you can see here is uh, on the left two degrees and on the right four degrees. 
So this is independent of SSP. And the darkest blue uh, is showing uh, the areas that are least affected. Uh, and the darkest brown is showing the areas that are mostly affected. So you see the least effects at two degrees in the north of Scotland, and the greatest with 50 to 60 percent loss of species that could be used uh, in the southeast with four degrees of warming. The next slide is looking at the local extinction rate across all the species studied. Uh, how rapidly do species decline as climate warms? So uh, the, this is looking at the species that are currently present in each grid cell and then looking at whether the climate still remains suitable for that species in the future. So this work does not include the potential of species to move to new locations under climate change. Uh, and although vertebrates do have an ability to do that, invertebrates and plants, reptiles and amphibians often don't. And furthermore, the UK landscape is highly fragmented and uh, by species can often not cross urban or agricultural areas. Also, most all species are dependent on other species and therefore, even if they do move, they might not be able to survive if the species they've co-evolved with are no longer present. So what you can see here is, oh. okay, so uh, in these maps, the agricultural areas are colored white and the urban areas are colored black. Uh, and then you can see the rate of extinction per half degree warming, uh, which uh, is roughly linear, but this was taken by looking at uh, the difference between one and a half and four degrees and then averaging it. But what you can see here is that the areas that are most resilient are in the north of Scotland, and those that are losing species fastest are in the southeast. So then uh, if we extract from those the pollinator species, so many of our crops rely on, on pollinators, and this is looking at the projected loss in pollinators. And you can see this exceeds 50% in major agricultural parts of England, even at two degrees. And at four degrees, this increased to 70% and extends over more of southern England and into Wales. So this is quite a serious issue and may compromise some of the opportunities that I showed in the earlier slides for agricultural crops. Uh, and lastly, I want to show you a, po a more positive message, which is about biodiversity refugia. So where more than half of the models agree that the climate will be suitable for more than three quarters of the species currently present, we call that a refugia, and we've mapped out where they are. And the darkest blue ones are refugia at four degrees. And the map on the left is showing uh, the areas that are priorities for conservation, and that means they're already natural, they're currently suitable for biodiversity, and that whereas the ones on the, ones on the right are areas that are not, uh, that could be restored and are currently being used for agriculture. So left map, conserve, right map, potential restoration. Uh, and so that is where, in the absence of other priorities, you could conserve or restore in order to ensure the integrity of our ecosystems into the future. So I will now hand over to Paul to talk about flooding.